All right, so welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to review the work done in sprints 50 and 51. We actually um, don't have any updates on these um, intro slides. So you can see the list of teams and what the current focus is, as well as all the current team members, but there's no one uh, new to introduce this time around. Oops, let me just pop, mute everyone here. <clears throat> Okay. Um, all right. Um, so given that, I'm just going to kind of cruise through these slides and um, hand it over to Jakob, who is going to talk a little bit about the Q4 release, just because we're getting close to some key milestones. Um, we talked about them last time, but we thought it was worth revisiting again this time around. Jakob, are you on? Uh, yes, thank you, Kate. I just joined. Uh, just <laughs> right, right time. All right, let me just open up. Do you want me to what? open the release milestones or do you want to take over sharing? <clears throat> I can do it. I think okay. that's fine. Let me stop share. Um, all right, let's share this. All right, um, so guys, uh, we've, uh, I believe last sprint review and the one before we talked about this a little bit. Um, this has not changed uh, much compared to what we have discussed previously. So the, uh, the release plan uh, and the, those essential uh, milestones uh, have not been modified in any way. And I'll walk through the the major ones again, just to make sure that that everybody's on the same page here. Um, the new stuff is that we, uh, since the last sprint review, have established the Q4 release channel on Slack. It's called uh, hashtag release uh, minus Q4 minus 2018. Uh, that is the channel um, uh, where all the uh, aspects of this release will be discussed. So, you know, if you have any questions or if you want to find somebody who can help you finding information, I mean, that's the channel to go to. Um, that's the channel where all the updates will be posted about this release. So uh, we've uh, bootstrapped that channel with um, uh, with some members. Uh, essentially, those should match with uh, previously uh, the, the, the the members of that previous channel that's been set up uh, similarly for Q3 release. Um, but there's been some changes in the project in terms of teams and terms of product owners. So uh, so it's a good idea to you know to 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 find that channel on Slack and you know, reach out if, uh, if some things, uh, some stuff is not aligned, if people are missing from the channel. Um, so let's now talk about this, um, um, about the main milestones uh, here. Um, this week on Friday, uh, the first uh, um, uh, milestone is coming up, the first sort of essential critical milestone is coming up. That's, um, that's M4 and M5. Um, and let me start with M5. So M5 is essentially an API freeze um, for the core backend modules. Um, or the core backend modules, so those are the modules, so, so the, those are the, the internal APIs uh, of Folio. Um, or copy uh, provided by a copy and, and, and other core modules uh, that are used across Folio, like mod tax, mod notify, and so forth, um, will be finalized. Uh, there will no be there, there will be no changes beyond that point in terms of APIs. Similarly, core functional modules like circulation, circulation storage, inventory, and inventory sto storage will be finalized uh, on Friday. Uh, there's still some changes pending uh, to those um, uh, functional modules. There will be more changes coming, especially to uh, inventory uh, within the next couple of days. Uh, but beyond uh, Friday, uh, uh, there will be no more uh, API changes. Um, uh, definitely no breaking API changes. So that will be the baseline for the next release. 
the next uh, important milestone is uh, the 7th uh, of December, uh, M7. Um, that is the milestone, uh, there is a deadline by which uh, we expect the external modules to be released according to the release procedures that are uh, no different from, uh, from the Q3 release procedures. Um, those have been also posted on the channel. They, they're attached to the, um, uh, to the release uh, uh, coordinating spreadsheet. Um, now, a few words about that spreadsheet. So that spreadsheet has been shared on, on that channel, channel and has been also shared with email uh, with all the POs in the project. Um, uh, that spreadsheet has, uh, maybe let me actually open that spreadsheet here. For, That spreadsheet has essentially um, uh, two sheets. The, sheet, uh, the first sheet is core modules. Uh, it's a sheet with all uh, modules that are built uh, by the core team and by Stripes Force. So uh, it includes all the uh, all the backends, uh, the the the, the backend, the platform dependencies, uh, uh, frontend uh, libraries, Stripes libraries. And uh, uh, and core uh, functional backend modules like circulation and inventory that, that I mentioned already. Um, those modules, uh, all of those modules, will be released by Friday. Uh, this spreadsheet tracks their versions, uh, and it also tracks the versions of inter interfaces provided along with those modules. Uh, in some cases, they're not uh, they're not one and the same. So uh, it's often that the Backend modules provide multiple interfaces, so interfaces are more granular than modules themselves. You know, example of that is um, uh, mode circulation. <clears throat> mode circulation, mode inventory, mode inventory storage. So those those provide a more granular interfaces. Um, that the UI modules will depend on. Uh, uh, in order to construct a, um, uh, a release, a consistent release, uh, those need to be aligned uh, with uh, dependencies of the UI modules. So uh, beyond Friday, uh, none of those will change, uh, which will give us a fixed target uh, to make sure the, uh, the front end releases uh, are aligned. Um, in most cases, this is essential for the core UI modules, um, but in other cases, it could also have an impact on external modules, both backend and frontends. Uh, but that that impact is, has, has less surface area, so it's 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 much smaller. So this is the this is the spreadsheet that will track all of it. Uh, it's not finalized, as I said. It will be finalized on Friday. Uh, the other spreadsheet here is the spreadsheet uh, that includes a list of all external modules that we want to ship along with this release and some modules that we know we definitely don't want to ship and those are indicated as NA here. Uh, those modules, uh, this, this sheet has been essentially bootstrapped by the information that we have from the Q3 release. As I mentioned, it might uh, not be fully up to date. Um, uh, so the reminder that's been set out to the POs uh, is essentially about making sure that that information is up to date. So that we have the leads listed here and the versions that, are, uh, that should uh, find its way into the Q4 release. And obviously, um, those uh, those those modules will need to be released by the deadline, which is the seventh um, of December. Uh, finally, uh, what I've already mentioned, the uh, fourteenth of December, that is the deadline for the for the core UI modules, um, uh, leaving a little bit more space for finishing up some uh, uh, some uh, UI only uh, functional work. Um, uh, those modules are not used as dependencies in Folio, so uh, that's why it's possible to push that release forward a little bit and uh, without creating a um, uh, a stoppage, a, a, a roadblock for uh, for external modules. Uh, those are the most uh, most important uh, milestones. There is more milestones that are specific to certain activities like uh, internationalization. 
Um, uh, what is also interesting is that uh, we expect um, uh, to set up the Q4 environment before uh, Christmas, um, uh, December 21st to be specific. Uh, by that time, we, we should have all the module releases. Obviously, we're prepared for bug fix releases that will happen um, um, you know, all over um, or throughout uh, December until the very end, until the publish uh, date of the release, which is the 14th of January, where Q4 will become final. <clears throat> uh, the time uh, until the 14th of January from the 21st of December is essentially a time to harden that release. Uh, we'll be testing the Q4 environment, we'll be reporting issues, uh, we'll be addressing the most critical ones, <clears throat> excuse me, or providing workarounds. Um, so that's essentially the plan. I should say that uh, all throughout December, uh, starting from uh, uh, Monday next week, we will make a continuous attempt to build the Q4 release environment. We won't be waiting until the very end uh, when all the modules are final and provided. Uh, uh, we'll make that attempt earlier. Um, uh, we don't expect that attempts to be uh, fully successful. Uh, uh, there will be cases where there is some dependency mismatches that will prevent a fully successful uh, creation of that environment. Uh, but we'll use the, uh, the, the feedback from, from those attempts uh, to understand the, uh, the extent of dependency issues and will obviously inform uh, involved parties, so people responsible for specific modules. Um, so that's essentially the plan. Are there any questions uh, or is there something I should clarify um, uh, with respect to the release, the Q4 release? I guess that was very clear, Jakob. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Obviously, if you guys have any, any additional questions, uh, please go ahead, use the release Q4 2018 Slack channel. We'll try to be you know, uh, monitoring that channel, be very responsive and, and handle all the issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um... Let's see, I think actually I skipped forward a bit. <clears throat> uh, okay, right. So we talked about the Q4 release. Um, this is the same definition of done slide that we presented the last review. Um, nothing has changed since the last review um, as regards definition of done. That said, um, in tomorrow's um, product owner meeting, Anton will be um, talking to the POs about a couple of things. Um, one of which is um, discussing how we might start to include test coverage as part of our acceptance criteria for our user stories. So um, it may be that by the next sprint review, you'll see some changes on this definition of done slide. Okay, so we have um, the highlights for all of the teams captured in the deck. Each of the POs has updated for their respective teams. And um, I'm just gonna skip over those to make sure we have time for the demos. And here we are. So um, we've got Thunderjet, um, the acquisitions team, Follyjet Vega, Stripes Force, workflow proof of concept, I'm excited about, at Cult core team, and um, Anton will wrap up with a quality dashboard. Um, so we're gonna start out with Thunderjet with Harry and Pavel. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, just a quick introduction slash reminder. Um, we'll be demonstrating OAI PMH, and this is both a standard and a service for Folio that provides the ability for external services to query and harvest Folio library catalog over HTTP. And uh, it's mainly API functionality. Um, what's important is there are always two aspects to this, the harvester and the actual service. We are building the service, not the harvester. The harvester is for other external tools to provide. And 
in case you're asking why, why won't we build this? Um, most discovery services um, or layers that exist in the market today can use OAIPMH to harvest a catalog automatically, um, which is super useful. There are content management systems that are able to use it. Um, it's especially useful in union catalog situations. In fact, I assume it will prove very useful for the reshare project that's ongoing or kicking off as well. And uh, finally, today we'll be doing a demonstration of this. We'll actually be using um, MarkEdit as a harvester because it does have some harvester features. And uh, from that, uh, real quick, Craig, I'm going to turn it over to you because I believe you have a few things you want to mention. Sure, thanks, Harry. So uh, just a couple quick things. Um, this is this solution is comprised of both an Edge API as well as a backend module. Um, and so the backend module. I believe is deployed to Folio testing and, and Snapshot Stable. Uh, the Edge API, however, is not. So um, we're in the process of getting that deployed, um, but it's just not ready yet. So as a result of that, um, today's demonstration will be given from uh, one of the developer's machines. That's it. So uh, Pavel, take it away. Thank you, Harry and Craig. So I'm sharing my screen now. Let me know, please, if you can see it. We can see it. Okay, thank you. So, um, as Craig mentioned, we have, uh, by the way, uh, as you understood uh, by now, this was mainly backend work, so no UI from our side this time. Hope it won't, it won't be too boring. <laughs> uh, so, as Craig mentioned, we have implemented uh, two modules. Uh, one is a new regular RMB uh, module, uh, which contains uh, all the OEI PMH business logic and also H API module, which is supposed to sit outside of a copy. And uh, it is supposed to bridge the gap between a third party harvester and uh, a copy. So you may notice that uh, team great did uh, a really great uh, job in keeping uh, uh, quality and specifically uh, test coverage uh, really high. Um, so let me switch to the specification. I'll just point out the most important features of this specification. Uh, first of all, uh, the standard is HTTP based uh, in the sense uh, that it uses HTTP request, um, requests, but it is not uh, RESTful uh, service actually. Uh, so uh, the standard uh, supports various types of metadata uh, and uh, in this run we implemented uh, Mark 21 and uh, Dublin Core, as uh, these are the most common and mon uh, most often used uh, metadata types. Uh, so, one of the important uh, features of this protocol is flow control, which is about uh, partitioning the uh, uh, response about partitioning the responses, which may be really huge into a series of, uh, of responses. So uh, we have implemented this part uh, using one of the approaches uh, described in, uh, uh, in OER implementation guide. Uh, so the rest of the specification describes uh, the so-called verbs, which are, are actually requests uh, used within a standard. Uh, so these verbs are pretty self-descriptive, so I won't uh, describe each of them. Uh, so, uh, hold on. Uh, so let me now switch to the actual demo. So since this, uh, this is just API, in order to make it a bit more visual, I'm going to use um, uh, Mark Edit, uh, which is a tool that uh, have uh, OAI PMH Harvester as part of it. So uh, let me run it. Uh, so here I specify the address of uh, Edge uh, API that is uh, deployed locally right now. And uh, there is possibility to choose uh, type of uh, uh, format uh, in which metadata should be returned uh, from the service. Let's use Dublin Core uh, as an example. And here we go. Uh, I have uh, about 400 uh, records. Uh, 
in inventory repository right now. So here we go. Uh, the results. So we can see that 409 records uh, has been harvested, and uh, it was harvested in uh, 40 uh, using a sequence of 40 requests. Uh, this is because um, currently. Uh, our service returns <coughs> 10 records uh, per response, but this is configurable option and uh, we can set any actually. Uh, so these are all the records returned. Um, by the way, speaking of uh, configuration, our service supports um, uh, several configuration options which can be provided via uh, mod configuration um uh, here they are uh, uh, also all these uh, configuration options uh, sorry uh, uh, are listed in uh, readme of our mod oi pmh module here they are uh, all the configuration options uh, as well as descriptions uh, so um also, I would like to point out that as part of this work, we have uh, implemented uh, API tests, uh, which are uh, committed already to fully API test module. Uh, I will show them real quick. Uh, so here they are. The, this API tests follow common structure. They uh, consist of uh, test setup, uh, where we load, preload some test data, uh, then, uh, positive scenarios are tested, negative scenarios are tested, and um, then test cleanup is run, which uh, removes all the uh, data that we loaded for testing. And uh, here is an example of running those tests. Uh, I just ran it before uh, the demo, and you can see that all of them passed successfully, none of them failed uh, against my uh, local environment. And also we have implemented um, uh, uh, performance tests uh, for our mod module, which are also already committed to follow perf test. Uh, so the last thing I would like to say is that this is uh, almost final version of this uh, service. Uh, the only piece of work to, to be done is to finalize integration with uh, source record storage. So currently we are uh, using inventory storage uh, as uh, a source of metadata records. And uh, but we are going to switch to newly created uh, source record storage. Uh, this work that is almost done. And um, once it is done, uh this uh, i think this work will be uh, can be considered fully done for now uh that's it if you have any questions uh please go ahead i guess no questions so uh, i will wrap it up thank you for your attention Thanks, Pavel. That's really very cool. Um, okay, so next we have acquisitions and development up with um, Dennis and uh, Alexi. Alexi. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to do a quick introduction before I hand things over to Alexi and mention a few things that we've sort of been working on. So alongside of improvements to the vendors and finances, application, we've done a substantial amount of work on the design of the orders module um, and the way it intends to function in preparation for Q4, some of the integration work that's coming for the orders application in general. Um, we've also, I guess, had the opportunity to focus on onboarding a number of additional developers and other folks to this team that is doing acquisitions work. Um, some of them joined us a few weeks ago, and you're about to see some of the benefits of that. Alexi is going to show uh, a handful of things that I'll describe in a second. Another group is, has actually joined us today, and, and are, we're looking forward to them making a big impact over the next few weeks as well. Um, so there's just a quick update on acquisitions. What you're going to see today, 
just a just a little preface to this is primarily the view functionality uh, or the retrieval of information regarding orders and order lines from the orders application. Uh, I think Alexi is going to show uh, a few bits of the purchase order and purchase order line uh, UI. And we've really focused on getting appropriate metadata into the application to ensure that we have what we need to power our associated business logic in the coming weeks obviously understanding freeze is coming up here and um, so the, the the create and edit functionality will be working on catching that up over the next few weeks what you're seeing here is, is view the retrieval of information uh, and the viewing of order information primarily I hope that's a fair introduction Alexi I'll, I'll hand it over to you to show a couple of things uh, thank you thank you Dennis uh, it's a nice introduction. So uh, today uh, I'm going to show you uh, a part of acquisitions. It's order. I hope you see my screen. Uh, as it was mentioned before, folio testing is down uh, and uh, I can show you from my local environment. Uh, anyway, um, what we can see is in a list of orders. So we are working on orders module external module and uh, uh, yeah right now it's a list of uh, orders by PO number uh, we can click on uh, order to fetch details and uh, as you can see uh, we do have here purchase order details uh, with uh, several fields and uh, blocks describing that purchase order uh, purchase uh, order summary uh, purchase purchase order lines uh, and adjustments that's for purchase order uh, also we do have uh, edit functionality and we have worked on uh, aligning uh, like form a page for order and uh, to introduce some fields uh, again uh, it's still under development and it's not connected to api so just bringing this to ui we do have uh, nodes and other uh, fields here as well uh, some of them are clickable. Uh, actually, most of them, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, go deeper to purchase order lines contained contained in that order. Uh, also, we can go to purchase order line details to see some details uh, uh, and uh, a number of blocks here also with details for the particular line uh, i'm not sure if i have to describe all of that uh, i hope it will be done later when it's all connected uh, all pieces together with api but anyway uh we do have a lot of information here and we're still working on some of that blocks uh yep so uh and we also do have uh, an edit functionality in purchase order line and we can go to form page to edit this purchase order uh, as well as uh, additional information like cost details uh, actually it's like calculated uh, we might have different currencies in the future and um, uh, we do have a different like blocks for physical resources and electronical resources 
it also click clickable, but we can't uh, save it for now. Uh, yep. So if you have any additional questions, please uh, uh, ask. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, we are working on uh, this uh, uh, UI uh, mockups, uh, implementing uh, still. And it's uh, actually, we're trying to get this uh, done in Q4. So uh, yeah, please ask me any questions. Thank you. So it's looking good. Um, if there's anybody from RM SIG on the call, we know that there are some bits that that still need some cleanup. Where um, th this is the first time that we've gotten the whole screen together for the PO and PO line. So we're going to be working on some of those um, little little cleanups to the UI. But um, but we've I think finally got all the data elements in there. Yeah. The Sorry. <clears throat> the other thing that um, folks may not have noticed that's that's really exciting about this is that the form's actually responding to the order format. So there are certain fields that we're expecting to see for electronic resources versus physical resources versus mixed of electronic and physical. And so um, we're actually now doing some of that work where if your if your purchase order line is physical uh, or electronic, that you're actually able to to add those details as well associated with the order. Um, so lots of lots of work has gone into what you're seeing here and, and uh, we're excited to see it continue to progress. Right, thank you. Hi, thank you, Alexi. Uh, thank you, so I'm stopping the presentation. Okay, um, great. So um, next up is Folija with Sasha. Yep, and I'm going to do just a really quick intro and then hand it to Sasha. So Folijet's been working on the data import, which is the um, we're starting with mark records, um, bringing them in to affect things in inventory and mark cat and source record storage and acquisitions. And so Sasha's going to demonstrate two things. The, the data import landing page or, or home page when you first open the app is complete. And a lot of the work for the last two sprints has been Folijet building a file upload component. We're going to use it first in data import, but they've, they've created it in such a way that Stripes Force will be able to make it into a generic component for any folio apps to use to be able to upload files um, to other records or to their apps. And um, we're demonstrating from a local Foliojet environment that today. We, we hoped to demonstrate from Folio testing or snapshot stable, but we didn't quite get all of our sample data in and, uh, and merged in time. So that's a really quick intro and I'm gonna turn it over to Sasha. Yes, thanks Anne-Marie. Uh, hi all, uh, today I'm going to demonstrate uh, data import landing page and uh, a part of another page. So let me share my screen first. Um, yes, so do you guys can see it? Hopefully, yes. yes. Mm, great. Uh, so let me begin with uh, jobs pane, which is on the left. Uh, it has a preview section and running section which contains uh, jobs. So in preview section, uh, we have jobs uh, sorted uh, by st status. So ready for preview on top and in progress uh, on the bottom. And uh, they are also sorted by date from the most recent ones to the oldest. Uh, the same with uh, running jobs, they are sorted by date from recent to oldest. Mm. Each job has a title, a file name, and some other information like uh, dates and records and so on. 
and to, uh, jobs which are in progress or running uh, also have uh, uh, those um, uh, progress bars uh, which are uh, running and updating as you can see um, so yes as you can see it's a, it updates um, yes I think that it's uh, about uh, jobs pain let's let me move uh, to the logs pane so Basically, what we have here is a, a table with uh, uh, information about uh, logs data. Uh, it has a couple uh, column, uh, columns, uh, like file name, job profile, and others. Um, let me scroll to demonstrate all of them. Um, and we can scroll down as well. Um, I think... Uh, uh, Yes, that's it about logs. And the third pane is a uh, drag and drop area in which uh, we could uh, 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 just uh, drop our uh, files like that. Uh, and uh, after doing so, we are uh, navigated uh, to another page with different uh, road. Uh, and here we can see the process of uploading files with progress bar. Mm. It and yes, it's Ryan. That's it's uh, one hundred percent. So basically, it has file name, progress bar, and per, uh, uploading percentage. Um, going back to landing page, uh, here we can uh, drop files uh, also by clicking this uh, button. It's uh, just doing the same thing, but uh, with those uh, file uh, menu. And here we see the same thing, uploading files. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you for your attention. Nice, thank you, Sasha. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, if not, then next up is Vega with Dimitro and Kostya. Uh, yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Uh, so, um, in this demo, I'm going to present functionality for sending emails, um, uh, providing user uh, with the um, ability to reset a password. Uh, and first, I'd like to describe how messages are sent in Folio now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, great. So, uh, on this diagram, you can see a set of modules uh, our team has been working on to implement message delivery. One of them uh, is uh, Mod Template Engine. It just it simply stores templates uh, and processes them to prepare messages for sending. Um, Mod Event Config, config um, stores how messages should be delivered and what template should be used to build this message. Um, Module mod notify serves as entry point of notification system. It takes configuration, builds message using template engine, and sends uh, them to mod sender. Mod sender takes a list of uh, messages and uh, distributes them to different um, delivery channels like emails, SMS, and so on. Uh, now there is one delivery channel implemented. It's email uh, in mod email module. It takes uh, SMTP server configuration from mod configuration and uh, sends uh, an email. So let's move to the demo itself. Uh, now I am on um, edit um, uh, user profile page and here I have a link uh, send or set password email. Uh, when I click it uh, in a few seconds I've got uh, Mm, um, notification uh, that email was sent to some email and a link uh, that serves as fallback plan if a message wasn't delivered. Uh, this link uh, consists of uh, host that is configurable uh, 
in uh, mod configuration and uh, token. The last part is uh, token granting a user an, a right to reset his password. Uh, this uh, token is ex ex will expire in uh, 24 hours by default. So that is also configurable. Um, from this um, notification, uh, I can copy the link, you press the button and paste it uh, somewhere. Um, so let's check the inbox. And here we have a message. Um, it's to, it, it is built using a template. Some of the data, uh, some of data is um, filled uh, by personal information like uh, first name. And here we can see uh, the generated the generated link. Uh, now this uh, message has come from um, our test SMTP SMTP server. And I think it's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. So once we have this email capability, does this turn into something that other apps can use? Mm, yep, I think uh, yes, it's, if it uh, meets their requirements. Okay, yes. Um, Amory, yeah, so we can, yeah, we, the, the next project we'll, we'll, the team will we'll work on tied to emails will be patron notices. Okay, great. And I can see as one net for acquisitions for being able to email out orders or claims or things eventually. Mm -hmm. Great, yes, this looks really good. Thank you, Dimitro. Okay. Um, next up is Stripes Force with Jeffrey. Howdy. Howdy. Get this screen shared. There we go. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to mention uh, was uh, actually, does everybody see my whole screen? The outline looks a little weird on mine. We see getting started with big tests and stripes that oh, entire okay. window. So that's, that should be that should be good. Okay. okay. Cool. Good. Um, so uh, this was a doc that Will at Frontside put together um, about using big tests in modules. Um, Anton will probably talk a little bit more about this at the end with the quality dashboard. I just wanted everybody to know that this is now here. This is in Folio Work Stripes in the doc directory. Um, and Stripes Force in particular will be doing a lot of stories in the coming, uh, in this sprint and probably the next as well. And getting big test infrastructure into more repos um, it's now in inventory. I think users is up uh, for, for getting this, this sprint. Um, and what this will get us is tests on every pull request um, so that um, we're catching bugs much sooner um, so that we don't go days and like, hey, why is this integration test broken? Um, we should be catching these things um, before we even merge them to master. And that's kind of the whole idea behind this. Uh, so um, this is all here. It's long. It's good. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about internationalization too. Um, Stripe Source has been doing a lot of stories um, that look a little bit like this. Use documented React Intel patterns instead of stripes.intel. Um, so what's going on here is that uh, the Stripes God object um, that everybody kind of consumes to use Stripes Connect uh, and stuff like that. I'll try not to get too technical here, um, but, but essentially um, we were duplicating functionality that the React Intel library already provided to us. Um, and so what that was looking like, if we actually kind of look at this in, in eHoldings, um, eHoldings was not using this pattern, but I'll use it as an example. Um, if you see like, this is an internationalized string, this is an internationalized string, this is an internationalized string. Um, what was happening is, is most of the time what we would have a, this entire, actually I'll annotate my screen. This entire thing would be wrapped in a, hey, I subscribe to, um, stripes.intel. Um, so anytime that anything in that Stripes object changed, this whole section would have to re-render. Um, and instead, uh, the kind of the, the preferred way of doing it, um, according to the React Intel docs, is to keep your subscriptions as small as possible. Um, so instead of subscribing that whole thing, we're just gonna subscribe this piece, this piece relies on Intel, this piece relies on Intel, this piece relies on Intel, et cetera. Um, and so with those tiny subscriptions, 
we're getting better render performance. And because we're telling React, hey, you don't have to re-render this entire thing when something, anything on the Stripes object changes. Instead, just re-render this little piece when anything on Intel changes, and I don't care about anything else changing um, with, with this little piece. Um, so we get better render performance by doing it this way. And we actually stick to um, the, the patterns recommended by the React Intel library. Um, and the, those are built in uh, like a future-friendly way. Um, one of the things that uh, we were using with that old inter Intel pattern was um, this idea called context. Um, and the React API for context changed dramatically earlier this year. Um, and uh, the old way we were doing things still aligned with the old pattern. Um, so this is built in such a way that it works with the new pattern. Um, so this has been a lot of work and a lot of repos. Um, I think the, the, so if you've noticed um, issues filed for your repository along those lines, that's what's going on. Um, I believe that inventory and my profile are gonna be worked on by Stripes Force um, in the, if not this sprint, but in the near future. Um, and that should cover, I think, all the, all the uses of the, the old pattern. Um, so we'll have much better render performance and, and stick to a future-friendly way of internationalizing all of our strings. That covers it. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, okay, so up next we have a uh, demo discussion of the workflow work that's been going on with Peter and uh, Jeremy Warren. Yes, and I'm going to start. Uh, I was serving as, as the product owner for the proof of concept. Uh, going back into history a little bit, uh, we've been talking about the workflow uh, prototype and the to-do prototype and how to integrate those uh, into folio functionality. Uh, and we had even gotten so far as to start to write our own workflow engine. Uh, when we stopped and reconsidered and thought that this was an area where there's been a lot of open source work done already. Uh, and so we looked at uh, an open source workflow engine called uh, Kamunda. Um, and given the constraints on the development teams, uh, the stakeholders agreed to fund a consultancy uh, to help us with the proof of concept. Uh, and so in a moment, I'm gonna introduce uh, Jeremy Warren from BP3, uh, who we hired uh, to work on this integration. Uh, the proof of concept was uh, intended to answer questions about how much effort it would take, first, if it was technically possible, and then uh, how much effort it would take to do the various parts of uh, uh, workflow integration. Uh, and we think we have some answers uh, to those questions. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy to show what uh, we did over the course of the three sprints. All right, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Can hear you and see your screen, yes. Perfect, so just wanna, I have a demo, but just wanna run through a, you know, a couple quick slides like, uh, like Peter was, was mentioning. So quick background on Kamunda. So BPM or BPMN uh, stands for Business Process Modeling Notation. Um, so it's a way to basically annotate and describe uh, business processes. Uh, and Kamunda is just the open source platform for workflow and decision automation. Uh, in, you know, there's a lot of tools out there, but Kamunda really caters heavily towards developers in that it's you know, highly configurable and extensible. Um, so what you get when you basically deploy a Kamunda instance is you get the process engine itself, uh, but you also get kind of a workflow or admin portal, which is, which is a web app, which um, probably won't be used uh, by Folio extensively, but um, is gonna be used in the demo just you know, to show some UIs and you know, how tasking and uh, assignment works. Um, and then you also get a REST API that, that you can integrate with. And so some of the benefits of um, putting ben you know, some things in a workflow is you, know, you can visualize and define your processes. And so in the context of Folio, what would be really nice is kind of having um, some connections between modules where you know, there's, there's clearly defined uh, modules, there's automatic tasking that's assigned to users and users can have a, a centralized kind of to-do app or task list to, to manage their work. 
Um, so it has a lot of built-in tooling such as tasking, messaging, timers, error handling, um, and kind of the ability to either just manage or monitor your processes. So, you know, I'm going to show a demo of, of each, which is, you know, one where we're actually managing the workflow from within Kamunda and uh, driving the folio processes. And then another where folio is really kind of doing the driving and Kamunda is just kind of uh, moving the process along. So the goals for this project were, you know, to create a, an environment for development where we could actually have an integration between Kamunda and Folio uh, via Okapi, where they were communicating and able to send messages back and forth to each other, um, provide some sample workflows and functionality, just outlining what Kamunda can do, how to use it, how to use its Java API, its REST API, um, demonstrate the ability to programmatically develop uh, BPMN models, which is really just XML. Um, prototype some sample folio processes, validate Kamunda as a, as a viable option, and outline some estimates and resources. Um, so for the POC implementation, uh, what we have is we had a couple of uh, GitHub repositories. So Spring Module Core, which is basically a, a Spring module uh, version of Okapi. Um, this was uh, done, uh, a lot of work was done by the uh, TAMU guys, the Texas A&M guys, uh, getting this up and running. Um, the decision was made to use Spring Boot here just because Kamunda offers a Spring Boot library. Um, and it was, you know, given that it was a six week proof of concept, this really eliminated a lot of the headaches in order for us to get up and running and, and get an integration going so that we could actually, you know, build out some stuff. Um, we also have a mod workflow, which contains, you know, workflow, copy triggers and messaging and mod Kamunda, which is where the actual process models, uh, delegates, uh, custom workflow code actually lives. Um, so again, the main contributors were William Welling of Texas A&M, Jeremy Huff of uh, Texas A&M, and myself. Um, so let's get just quickly into the demo now. Um, so the one that I'm going to show is the claim return process. So basically for this claim return process, a, you know, the process is a patron claims uh, an item has been returned. Um, the item is then marked as, as claimed returned in their loan uh, within Folio. Um, so the items then added to kind of a claimed return list um, and it can be searched for manually by employees of the library um, and basically actions can be taken as a result of these searches. So you can increment the count. You can say that the item has been found and check it in. Uh, you can declare an item lost, um, which when you declare an item lost, uh, you have to send a patron notification, uh, update the item status and, uh, you know, bill the patron for it um, or you can declare an item missing. So this is, this is kind of a, a high level uh, outline of what a BPMN model looks like. So over here, basically any process has a, a start and a finish. Um, so, you know, a start, um, what we would do is when a claims returned is marked in Folio, we basically have a trigger within Folio to start the process. Um, we can log into Folio and we create a task for um, each item. And what this does is the process engine essentially creates a lot of metadata associated with this task. So you can query uh, the Kamunda API for, you know, any tasks open um, by user, um, by process, by, by the actual task itself. Um, we have some built-in timers here that basically say if this item hasn't been searched for within X amount of time or X amount of days, basically send a notification to um, you know, the library or the user or something to, hey, just kind of cue them that this, this hasn't been searched for in a month or five days or something like that. Um, they can take an action uh, from within this UI and then there's basically some decisions that are made. Was it checked in? Was it missing? Was it lost? Um, or they can, you know, increment the count and, you know, you can define a max count. So how many times can they search for it before the user has to make a decision? Um, so let's go ahead and get into the demo quickly. So this is what we're going to do. This is the, yeah, this is the monitor of the process. So the claims return functionality, I had to, uh, before I get started quickly. So this is a video. Um, the instance that we created for development uh, consumes quite a bit of CPU resources and kind of causes my computer to crash a little bit. So I recorded a video rather than doing this live because I was worried that my, uh, my computer might crash in the middle of the demo. But um, so basically we can um, log into Folio, um, go to a, um, a user or a patron, um, select them. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna check out an item. And so what happens when we check out an item is we have a trigger uh, built within Folio to actually um, trigger that an item has been checked out. Um, so we put a trigger here because the claims return functionality is not 
um, fully built in Folio yet. So ideally, this trigger would be when the item's actually marked as claimed returned. But uh, for the sake of the proof of concept, what we did is we basically just um, said, just do it for when it's checked out, um, just to kind of demonstrate the functionality. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing um, the Komunda task list. So this is a task list. So what happened was the item was checked out. Um, we received a message that said an item had been checked out. Komunda consumed that message and it started basically a workflow instance for this specific item. And we can see here that basically this is the item ID, this is the user ID, and this process was started with the um, ID of the loan or the ID of the um, item. Um, we have a checked count of zero, so this item just got started. Um, they haven't, uh, you know, done any, they haven't checked it out yet, so we're going to continue this. And so this is what we're doing here is we're just going to basically monitor the process. So we're not going to do anything with this actual workflow here, but what we're going to do is, um, so we're just going to inspect some, some metadata really quickly. We can see that there's um, an item on the update claimed. Um, this is the payload that was sent by Folio basically with the information of the item that was, that was checked out. Um, so the status is open. And then uh, what's gonna happen is we're gonna go back to Folio and we're gonna check this in uh, from Folio. So we have another, another trigger here that um, is going to you know, check this book in. And what it's gonna do is it's then gonna advance the process within Komunda um, to move it along and say that the book's been checked in and to basically cancel this process because the book's been checked in, sends a notification um, so you can, if you can see the notification down here, this is the claim return notification delegate. Basically the item was checked in from an external source and it would remove it from uh, the claims return list. So this is, um, this is just monitoring the process. So basically what we have here is Komunda is not doing much other than receiving messages from Folio and triggering the uh, workflow to basically advance the process along and what you can do here is you know you have visibility into how many claims are open where they are in the process um, you know what's happening behind the scenes um, and you can get a lot of metadata uh, there's tasking that you can do with this um, but this is just this is just really monitoring the process so if we wanted to actually drive the process from within Komunda um, we can do that as well so we're going to start with the same thing and we're going to check out three um, I think three items I'm going to uh, go along a little bit quicker here. So we're gonna check out three items. And so now we have three instances within Komunda that have been started and basically, you know, it's, it's update claim. So now we're gonna actually use the Komunda UI here, which is just basically a task. And this task has uh, metadata associated with it where uh, Folio could integrate with the REST API and just basically extract this data and display it in a user's to-do list. So you don't have to use this Komunda built-in task list, but you could basically extract this metadata and say, okay, we have this many open tasks from this specific process that are assigned to this specific uh, user profile. And they would just be able to go to that to-do list and um, basically perform their actions there. So we're just gonna increment this count a few times um, until the max count is reached. So we're just gonna increment the count. So the, I think I set the max count to two or three. Uh oh, Jeremy, did we lose you? Did he freeze? I th think so. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So let me let me pick it up from here, and and uh, we can share the the video of of the demonstration. Uh, coming from here, uh, we we do have enough detail to answer the questions from the, uh, the, the, the proof of concept. Uh, so we're preparing that report now and we'll be making a presentation to uh, technical council on December 12th uh, and probably to product council on December 13th. Uh, and uh, that will have answers to questions like, uh, uh, 
what kind of effort's going to take uh, to move this forward, uh, places where we had to hard code things that will need further development, uh, and how much effort that'll take, uh, and the like. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that will wrap it up. I do want to uh, thank Jeremy uh, Warren uh, and uh, William Welling um, and uh, Jeremy Huff uh, for their efforts on this. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to you, Kate. Thanks, Peter. That looks really promising. Um, okay. So uh, next up, we have at cult with Tiziana and Christian. Hi, hello. I, hi. Hi. I share my screen. Okay. So today we want to show you some update about uh, Marcat. Uh, uh, function we are working uh, and we um, we close the, the search function with uh, the addition of function to identify and uh, to show in a specific column the tags uh, uh, in which the terms uh, uh, are found so uh, for example if I search for all mark fields and I select the condition contains and I click and I type, uh, for example, Galileo. Um, sorry for slowness of the system, but we are showing you the local system, so uh, it's not so performing, uh, it's not so performant um, environment. So, a few seconds. Okay, so we have the result now, and uh, this is the column where uh, are shown the tags, the original tags, where the search term is found. So this is important for a librarian to, 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 to identify perfectly the type of searching and the result, to be sure about the result. So we can use uh, these uh, in all fields. Uh, and uh, in addition to this, uh, we are working uh, now on browse function. Uh, the browse function is uh, the ability to scan an index uh, and uh, to retrieve, to scan an index in an alphabetical order with uh, a number of uh, different function to check the heading and to arrive to the records. So for example, we can select uh, a name as a, a as filter and uh, a browse as a search condition. And uh, for example, rolling. So we can in this case scan or browse. And um, so uh, the, the final result is uh, a list of different heading and um, sorry for slowness again. And uh, uh, each heading can be controlled or not by uh, an authority record or it can be only used uh, in uh, bibliographic record. So as usually with the red and blue, we identify something that has an authority record or something in blue that does not steal an authority record. And uh, we start uh, in uh, the, we, we didn't finish the, the, this development because we need add here different uh, additional features such as the cross-reference for each uh, uh, heading, uh, for example, to show the variant form or some function that is, for example, to transfer record from a not controlled heading to another one uh, more controlled. So in this case, I can select uh, this that is uh, uh, an heading, an access point uh, uh, present in an authority record. And I can show uh, both the authority record and all uh, bibliographic uh, um, record that are linked to. Uh, 
So this is just uh, a, a brief update uh, uh, about, uh, and, uh, and we think with this function to close, uh, uh, to finish uh, all what we mean for searching something, searching for an authority, searching for a resource. Uh, and uh, we will show in the next uh, uh, some initial uh, function related to cataloging. So I don't know if Christian, you want to add something or if we can uh, finish here. Mm, no, Tiziana, I, I have no question. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if you want uh, to show uh, record detail, associated bibliographic detail. Um, okay, but uh, uh, okay, I can. Uh, for, for the search function. Yes, yeah, so, so for start with, for example, and. Uh, and okay, uh, probably it's important to say that uh, um, uh, we release uh, uh, the search function. I don't know if I click here. We release the search function um, on Folio repository. While we doesn't release uh, still uh, this uh, the, the the scan of the browse function uh, exactly because we are uh, working on it. So. Um, okay, so um, uh, in the, I suppose that in the next week we, we, we can release all. In any case, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the app uh, with the function that are already uh, useful uh, are available, is available, and uh, our market group is uh, testing. I prefer to stop here, Christian, because this is our local uh, installation. So some little problem we have, so to avoid the two, to lose some time for other people. Okay. Great to see it coming to life, Tiziana. <laughs> With some little problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it looks great. Thanks, Tiziana. Oh. Thank you. Okay, okay. This is what I want to show you. Okay, but uh, this is uh, something that you already have seen. So thank you for the attention. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so we've got the core team up next. Um, we're going to show some assorted enhancements in inventory settings and um, for circulation. And I just wanted to mention that um, while there are just a handful of things to show um, in this demo, there's actually been a ton of work going on um, that just wasn't tested yet. Um, so you'll be soon seeing some significant changes to the instance and holding records and inventory and um, some big changes to uh, the circulation, um, you know, check in and check out and how that all works. Um, so uh, let me turn it over to um, Aditya. Hi, Aditya. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sharing. Yeah, so the first one I wanted to show was adding a patron barcode um, token to the staff slip card. Um, so when we navigate to settings, circulation, staff slips. Um, so we have this new token here added to this rich, uh, rich text editor called request a barcode. Um, so when you preview this, so this is just a placeholder for now for the staff slip template. But if you want to actually see the usage for this, um, so you can preview it here as well. Uh, so you go to the requests and uh, Select the barcode and go to the check-in app. Oh, one second. Uh, oh, okay. Filled. Item barcode. Yeah. So if you have the print slip checked and you confirm this, so the barcode here is actually the user barcode or the requester barcode who's, um, we can verify this from, so 7532. Uh, so 7532, the barcode, the requester's barcode. So 
that's pulling from the real data here. Um, so that was the first one. And the second one is uh, adding, linking to the request queue from the loan details page. Um, so I have open loans here and I have a request to open against one of the items. So as you can see, the request queue here links you to the request app, which is pre-filtered by the item barcode and open awaiting pickup and open not yet filled. So that was the second one. I have a couple of other settings stories as well, which I'll show you quickly. Um, so we have added this, uh, so there, there's a lot of settings pages that's under work, under review actually, but two of them I'll show you now. Um, so, so settings inventory ILL policy under holdings. So this is the new settings page uh, for the ILL policy. So in uh, in folio, this ILL policy in uh, holding is the present in holdings record, which expresses the lending policy applicable for the given resource. So these are all the policies that are. Uh, uh, a part, this work was done by the backend work for this was done by Nels. Um, so we use the standard uh, control vocabulary here. When we open the ILL policy page, we have the ILL policy, the source, the last updated and the related actions. Um, the source here represents for the, the predefined uh, ILL policy is represented by folio. But when you try to add a new one, it gives you the local source. You can save this. All of these policies are sorted in alphabetical order. You can edit them, um, you can delete them, and you'll see this standard pop-up. See all the standard <clears throat> uh, control vocabulary actions. Similarly, there's, an, there's a call number types that's added to holdings items. So these are all the list of the predefined uh, call number types. And again, similarly, you can add a new one. The source is local. You have the last updated field here. And we uh, you can delete. So these are all the standard operations that you can do on it. So these are a, a couple of settings page. There are more, like, there are more number of settings page that will be probably be demoable for the next demo. Um, that's all I had. Any questions? Okay, thanks, Aditya. Looks good. Uh, Michal, you had a few things as well, I think. Uh, yes, sure. Hi, Kate. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you can you guys see my screen here? Yes, we can. Okay. So this will be very brief to very quick. Um, most of my changes were related to requests app. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show you is that we introduced this new um, permission called requests all permissions. Um, and I'm, I'm currently logged in here. Let me just move this a bit here. I'm currently moved in, uh, logged in as, um, as the user with just this one permission. So if I move to the screen here, you can see that um, the only access I have here is to requests module um, and there, there are no settings here or anything else. Uh, this still allows me to perform every, everything uh, under requests app so I'm able to um, search um, by different request types or you know create a new request here. Um, the, the other change we introduced here is um, uh, uh, some uh, that is, the other change we introduced here is uh, this uh, screen which you, you see here is completely empty now. So this is kind of aligned with uh, what we have in other modules like user modules. So by default, you won't see uh, anything on the screen and um, you will have to search or use uh, the search and filter here to, to actually see something on, on, uh, on the right pane. Um, the, the other change we were working here on is uh, related to performance issues. We, we were running into some performance issues in, on the requests and you can see now that um, after a couple changes, we, we, we are able to see the uh, request details screen uh, a, a bit quicker. Everything loads uh, a little bit smoother. smoother. Um, I believe there, there are still a couple additional changes we can um, do on the server side to, to improve it a little bit further, but um, 
this this is a bit better than what we had before. Um, and I think the last thing I wanted to show you here is that just recently we also introduced this uh, pickup service point, which which you can choose from um, when when adding a new request. Um, and those uh, uh, th those service points are the service points with a pickup flag set to true. So if I choose one of them, I'm, uh, I'm able to create a new request and the pickup uh, will be now associated with, uh, with the specific request. And um, I think that's it from me here. Great. Thanks, Michal. Any questions? All right. Um, then um, it's over to Anton with the quality dashboard to wrap us up. Are you on, Anton? I see that he is unmuted, but uh, I assume he's fixing his audio. Okay. While we're waiting for Anton, I'm just going to bring up the one last slide that I did want to show. Um, so the deck does contain you know, the plans for the coming sprints for each product owner. So you can take a look at that if you're interested. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to let everyone know is that um, we are actually planning the next sprint review on December 18th. That's only three weeks away. Um, and that's because um, our regularly you know, Interval would have had us um, doing a review on Christmas. So we decided to pull it um, back a week. Um, so we will have another sprint review before the holidays. Um, and I'm actually not going to be around, but Holly Misselbauer will be hosting. So, um, so can you guys fun. hear me now? We can. Oh, excellent. I apologize for that. So I understand I'm the last guy between lunch or dinner. <laughs> and so I'll try to be very, very brief and quick here to give you a quick overview. So at the top of the dashboard, you see a lot of red faces that's similar to the Google traffic pattern. So um, it's kind of we're moving, but we're not moving fast enough. Uh, and um, our trend for the past sprint was a sideways. So let me highlight good things that happened during this sprint. So in terms of code coverage, we do track 102 projects uh, in the code coverage. And for UI projects, uh, we finally have all UI projects reporting. So at this point, we don't have a lot of projects that reporting code coverage, but there was a good reason for that because we didn't have a tooling to um, uh, tooling to build the code coverage. But that being said, as Jeffrey mentioned earlier, we do have a manual uh, uh, and a tool set that would uh, allow everyone who's building UI modules to start building, uh, building uh, unit tests and integrate them into Jenkins build process. So, I would say uh, we ev everyone can start start now, but uh, for the future features, we will be working with product owners, and they will be requiring uh, unit tests to be built uh, to build uh, to be built for the new features, and will uh, uh, well, and uh, you as the developers have to uh, show them the coverage and show them that test has been built. And also we'll be scheduling probably catch up work to build the code coverage for the modules um, that, you know, for the features that already active, but, you know, missing tests. So that's, that's kind of very encouraging uh, step. Uh, I'm very excited that we can finally kind of start building tests for, you, um, for UI. Jumping to performance tests. So um, as you know, we have a performance test job in Jenkins that runs daily. And I am 
kind of capturing one of the you know the latest day that I have uh, test results and right now the passing bar is 10 seconds so you see the list of APIs that are slower than 10 seconds and the good news here is that it's um, most of them related to one module so if we concentrate effort on UI inventory and UI inventory storage, then this problem should go away. And they mostly related to how Postgres is processing uh, indexes. So, uh, so right now it doesn't take a hint and it does a full scan. Therefore, it takes a lot of time to uh, to produce a response. But uh, uh, I'm list, listing issues here that's being worked on. So hopefully soon we'll have a have a results uh, have encouraging results uh, in on the performance side uh, for uh, for the inventory. In terms of uh, uh, folio bug statistics, I think we're moving sideways. We are keeping the bug count around uh, 400, 401, and but you see that the gap is kind of opening. So. I encourage every team to look through the bugs that are open through um, against your modules and kind of plan them into your sprints to squish, squish them down and keep them uh, down to a number as kind of as big as your immediate family. So if you have a, something like 43, which is like quite a big family, then it's probably not a good thing. And, there's will be a lot more effort needed to to um, to uh, clean this up compared to something when it's just one or two. So just encourage everyone to keep bug count low for your modules. Um, in terms of CI/CD with uh, and integration tests. Uh, we uh, DevOps team has been very busy. There's a lot of problems to be uh, to be solved. So recently, guys solved the problem with the vagrant boxes running out of memory. Uh, so this this problem is uh, kind of alleviated for the time being. And the next one would be to enable product owners to have access to the code much sooner than they had before. So we need to figure out how give how to deploy a build that hasn't been committed to, or feature that hasn't been committed to master and provide access to product owner uh, uh, for the approval, because right now we do it on the Folio snapshot stable, and that's kind of way too late in the cycle. So we need to move it forward, and there are tasks that, um, that are on the list to improve, improve that. And, uh, other tasks that are in on that list are primarily dedicated to improving how we release the product overall because if you uh, at the beginning of the meeting you uh, heard Jakub explaining how release process work and all the spreadsheets that involved and how much manual tracking it uh, it involves and how much coordination so long-term goal would be to eliminate that effort and enable development team to have a feedback uh, about all the develop uh, all the dependencies and um, kind of all the gates that re uh, that required to deploy um, to integrate um, to integrate them a module into the common module pool for release so it would but obviously we need to build a lot of tooling around it so that you guys can kind of resolve all the problems uh, on your end and by the time you're ready to integrate it should be nice and smooth. So that being said, I think um, that pretty much covers everything that we have for this for this sprint and uh, I'll see you I'll see you next time hopefully with a lot of that you know good news about coverage and about performance. Thank you. Thanks, Anton. Does anyone have questions for Anton? Any other questions for anyone else? So not a question for Anton, but Kate, in our are we going to talk more about the 
PO related stuff that Anton mentioned in our PO meeting? Yes, actually, he's going to be presenting to us tomorrow about um, incorporating test coverage into our um, acceptance criteria for our stories. So it becomes part of the definition of done um, cool. for closing a user story. And I just want to make a plug because we always zoom by the uh, the slides that are the the list of things that the different teams have accomplished and that are on the agenda for the next sprints. But if anybody ever has questions about those, I think it's worth taking a quick look at those when we get the PowerPoints and then checking in with the teams or with the POs. So much good work there and not all of it can be demonstrated. It's a very good point. Okay. Any other questions or plugs? <laughs> All right. Then I think we can wrap up three minutes early. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see each other again on December 18th at the next sprint review.